Well, good morning. It is great to see you all. I haven't been in the house for a while, and it is lovely to see faces.、Um, we're in that time of year when we're still in the after of 2020, and I, I will go to the hard parts of 2020, but you know, this is the time of year when we celebrate who was the person of the year, and who was the tax collector of the year, and who, who was the garbage person of the year. We have a lot of of the year things. Zoom had to be tech item of the year, don't you think? How many of you have spent more time on Zoom lately than you ever wanted to in your life, right? We live on Zoom, and, and so Zoom gets a vote for, for tech item of the year, but the second place may go to the skip intro button. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? What are you binging lately is kind of the question. It would be great if we were all very literate and, and reading, but frankly, I don't read as much as I binge. And, and so, so, as we binge, we're watching things that were built to be watched once a week, but we're watching them back to back to back. So, they're assuming that we've forgotten what happened before. But you and I are sitting there in our sweats on our seventh episode, right? We've watched seven in a row, and we're trying to reach for another beverage. And, and on comes this intro of what has been happening on the show, and we just want to. And then comes the skip intro. The skip intro, and we just press it and we're on. It's a beautiful thing, but it doesn't usually work for church. You may not have been binging Riverbend services. I'm sorry, Dave, but we haven't got a lot of people watching seven in a row.、Um, it's a good thing, though, if you tune in for Sunday. My favorite sort of Binge that I keep in the background a lot of times is The West Wing, where the voice comes on, one of the characters comes on and says, Previously on The West Wing. And lately I've been skip introing it, but I thought this morning, because the series that Dave just finished was so powerful, and because especially the ending to that series was off the charts, I thought we'd do a little West Wing tribute. So, so, Dave's been in Genesis 1, 2, 3, taking us through the creation, taking us through the creation of humanity, and then taking us through the Garden of Eden and the mishaps there. And last week ended in an extremely profound place. So, previously at Riverbend Church, you see the, the beginning of this year. <laughs> Has, has not really gone like most of us had hoped. 2021 has kind of turned into a cluster of sorts on its own, and we just thought 20, 2020 was about as bad as it could get. We're finding out no, you, you need to be more imaginative. But I'm here to tell you today it's perfect. It's perfect. Because what I am seeing around me is a culture that is broken and divided. And what it needs, as much as it ever has, are men and women who will see themselves qualified to be the agents of the restoration of God, to be agents of reconciliation and voices of redemption and healing now as much as ever. Welcome you to 2021. Happy New Year. I told you it was a powerful ending. If you saw it last week, it's good to see it again. If you didn't see it last week, retrace and, and hear that sermon. Because when I was listening to it, and I got to admit, tears were running down in my eyes by the time he finished last week. When I listened to it in Bible code, I heard 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. And I don't know about you, but as Dave ended there, with us broken and therefore in a perfect place somehow to understand our world and go out into it, I was longing for a new creation. Anybody else? He was preaching. 
a new creation, the hope that God can make new what we may have given up with, given up on. And so this morning, I would like us to sit together with his last call of that finish, which is for agents of restoration, for agents of reconciliation. Dave got us all over here to the place where we know we're equipped and we know the world needs. And the question is, are we ready? Are we ready to sign on? And so uh, will you pray with me for a moment and then we'll talk about how we might move into the world in a restoring way, in a reconciling way as church. So will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts Be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It has been a hard 12 months, right? And 2020 is in the rearview mirror, but not quite. And so we start off this new year, as as Dave said, in some kind of political trauma still. I came and preached in June of 2019, and we all thought, polarization had reached its high water mark. Do you remember? We had no idea. We had no idea. Americans are more estranged from one another across red-blue lines, across political lines, across racial lines, across all kinds of lines than, than we've ever been. And that lands with us. It lands not only in the things we suffer on the news, but in the way we look at one another. The Pew Research Center did a did a survey of people on our perceptions of one another across the aisle politically, across the red-blue aisle. And, and they, they simply asked questions about what we think the average opposite is like. And so, is the, if, you're a, if you're a blue person, is the average red person more blank than normal, right? And the, they range from patriotic or down through. But the two I want to seize on today because they seem operative above all the others. Because they answer what we do when we find out somebody disagrees with us. Because it turns out that over half of Americans, red and blue, over half of Americans think that the other side is more immoral than normal people. And... of Americans think that the other side is more unintelligent than normal people. Which lays out for us the truth that in our lives, in our sort of arrogant politics of our time, you and I can't fathom anybody disagreeing with us unless they're either evil or stupid. Right? Who in the world could not believe what I believe on this issue? Well, they must be Satan's spawn, or they must be just really, really dumb as dirt, right? That's our recourse, and it it turns out that right now, going to perceptions again, that 80% of Republicans think that socialists have utterly taken over the Democratic Party, and 80% of Democrats, and these numbers match up exactly, 80% 80 of Democrats think that racist and racism had fully taken over the Republican Party. Do you see what broad brushes we're painting with? And and the irony is, or the sad part is, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal a couple weeks ago in which the author produced evidence that we may be affectively, emotionally more polarized than ever, but ideologically, in the things that we believe, we're about where we were 30 years ago. The distance hasn't changed. Our our perception of the distance and our perception of what that distance means continues to, to widen, right? We get more and more unable to fathom the other side. And so, a, a survey, another one by the Pew Research Center, asked nations around the world. They surveyed in nations around Europe and East Asia and North America. They asked the simple question, last August, so five, six months into COVID, they asked the simple question, has your nation grown closer to one another during the COVID-19 pandemic? People from Denmark in 72% said yes. People from Sweden, 58%. People from 
South Korea, 56%. People from Japan, 54%. And on down, the United States, 18%. We were 21% lower than any other nation. We divided during the pandemic. We have divided because it's our, it's our role. It's our jam to, di- to divide. We've learned to do it, and we do it well. And we find ourselves estranged so that, maybe you can relate to this. I live in a neighborhood out southwest. Uh, you live in your own neighborhoods. But we are more and more putting signs up in our yard to tell that we're safe havens for the people who agree with us. You get to a, a yard with a Black Lives Matter or All Lives Matter sign, uh, you know, all the et cetera, red and, and all the down the rainbow, um, that these lives matter. Uh, you know what kind of house that is, what kind of people are in it, and how safe you might be with them. If you get to a blue flag, right, to a police supporting flag, you know what kind of house that is, and, and whether you'd be safe there, you'd feel like that's a haven for you or not. We, we signal to one another whether we ought to be in the same room or not, or what, whether we ought to be in the same neighborhood or not, right? We're so divided. And Dave left us last week with a charge that looked good a few days ago at the inauguration. The new president, Joe Biden, used the word unity in his speech more times than any other president has ever used the word unity in an inaugural address, right? That looks good. People texted me and emailed me because they know the business I'm in. I do this House United stuff and try to bring left and right together. And and they said, Alan, look at this. It's going forward, right? Well, it turns out that the five presidents before him have all included in their inaugural address that they're going to solve the division in the country. So I'm still watching. How about you? Right? In in fact, if we have habituated left-right difference and, and distance, Washington has us beat in spades. Because, as as Ben Sass points out in his book, Them, and I'll get back to it in a little bit, Ben Sass, conservative senator from Nebraska, points out in a book called Them, Why We Hate Each Other and How to Heal, right? In that book, he points out the lucrative business that polarization is. Politicians make more money when they go polar, and media clicks happen in droves when they go polar, So there's a big business for media and politicians in staying separate. They make more news, they get more more votes and money, right? I don't suppose we ought to wait for Washington. If we're going to build community, if we're going to be the healed, restored community that Dave hoped last week, that we all in our bones somehow hope to be, we probably can't wait for the people in Washington I think we're going to need to lead them. And so you and I, as church people in 2021, have this calling. We need to be restorers. We need to be reconcilers. And this is where God was way out in front of us. Because you know the verse I just, I just read to you, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Here's 18 and 19. Look what it does. All this is from God, writes Paul, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world, the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has com- committed to us the message of reconciliation. So you see how that was Bible code at the end of Dave, Dave's message last week? He was telling us, let's get our 2 Corinthians 5 on. Let's be a people who know that we're broken. Let's be a people who know that we're bent, who know that we need, and therefore are equipped to go out into a world in need. Julie Watts was all over this. Now, you don't know Julie Watts. She was a rising star in Olympia, Washington politics, not, not politics actually, she was working behind the scenes as sort of a, a, an advocate or a lobbyist, and, and she was young, in young thir- early 30s and rising. 
when I took a job at a downtown church as senior minister in a, a downtown church in Seattle. And this church liked as much as Riverbend does to do mission. They love to serve people. They love to uh, help the homeless. They love to be out in the world serving. And so we had gotten funding for a three quarters time mission pastor position or a mission director. And I got, you know, it was one of my first acts to do the personnel around that. And so I got all the applications and I read them. And they were like this. They went bump, 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 and then Julie Watts. Right? All the others were good people, I'm sure. And they had a heart and they, were, they, they really agreed that we ought to be out there. She was a, a rock star. And you know what you do if you've ever done personnel? When you see a rock star apply for a job that doesn't seem right on their trajectory, you start to worry, how long are they going to be here? Do they really want this job? Are they just using it to do something else? So I sat her down and I said, you're, you're rocking Olympia. You're on everybody's lips. You, you, people know you and they react to you and you're doing this, this work. Why in the world do you want a three quarters time mission job at a church? And her answer just bowled me over. She said, Alan, I've been there long enough. I've been there 10 years. I've been there long enough to see that real change doesn't happen out there until lives are transformed in here. Right? That we can move furniture around politically and we can, we can put this budget toward that and, and this budget toward that, but everything eventually snaps back because there's a, a self-interested, power-interested thing going on. Real change doesn't happen out there until transformation happens in here, and I want to get started with that. And she took the job, and she was magnificent. Right? The Bible backs her up. The Bible backs her up. Some of the great stories of Scripture stand dotted across from Genesis to Revelation, dotted across reminding us of the kind of people that God has transformed. Think about Esau. Jacob and Esau, we learned the story when we were in Sunday school. Jacob, the schmuck, steals his older brother Esau's birthright and blessing. And in the second case, at the end of his father's life, uh, when, when Jacob uh, steals the blessing, Esau chases after him and murderous rage takes him over, but he just barely misses him as Jacob hightails it north to Haran, right? And so, so there's Esau waiting in the very last scene we've seen him in ready to murder his brother because of a grave offense, right? The Bible skips forward, and in chapter 33 of Genesis, the scene is, this is the scene the day after Jacob wrestles with God, the scene is Jacob's going to come back and join the promised land people again. He's been north, he's been building his fortune and his family, but he's going to come back into the land and he's scared spitless over what Esau's going to do to him. So he throws a bunch of retinue out in front of him, kind of as buffer or bribe, and he's, he's rolling in with his family and, and he, he kind of puts the women and children first and hides behind, and there's Esau with a bunch of uh, uh, hundreds of men, right? And here comes Esau and, he, and he's coming up toward and he runs toward Jacob, and you can imagine the fear. Last time he saw his older brother, he was about to get killed by him. So Esau runs toward him, and you know what he does? He throws his arms around him and embraces him and kisses him. And when that happens, the before and after of Esau catches Jacob so off guard that he says, I'm seeing the face of God in you. That's transformation. Later in the book of Genesis, God makes a, a boy brat called Joseph, the Technicolor Dreamcoat kid, makes a boy brat into an older, seasoned, powerful savior in Egypt as his family faces drought and famine. Further on, Esther's kin, kinsmen and kinswomen are about to be uh, genocided out of the Persian Empire because of the plot of an uh, insidious fellow named Haman. And she's approached about going to the king, and at first she's timid and doesn't want it. She's scared. I mean, kings are powerful, and this is a Persian king. He's very powerful. And, and yet, the, the repeated entreaty moves her from timid and scared and watchful for herself alone over into saving the whole nation with a brave trip to the king 
and entreaty. We see Peter, the, the apostle, who on that terrible Thursday night leading up to Good Friday and Easter folds like a cheap suitcase in front of a little servant girl when she says, you know what, you were with that Jesus guy, weren't you? As they stand outside the trial of Jesus. And, and he says, no, you got it all wrong three times and then the cock crows and his, his worst moment stands out there for all of history to see but then we show up at Pentecost, and there he is bravely speaking truth out to whole audiences that include the very people who put Jesus to death. We see in the Bible, time after time, this pattern developing of people realizing they have a need and giving themselves over to God to help with it and God changing them. You and I are on the launching pad for this kind of thing, and it's, a, it's good news to us that the Apostle Paul did some thinking about this, and he gives us a powerful little manifesto about transformation in Romans 12, 1 and 2. This is J.B. Phillips' translation. The one I memorized when I was a kid was, uh, I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may prove what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. J.B. Phillips takes us to another level. With, with eyes wide open to the mercies of God, he writes. Present your whole bodies, right? And then in the second verse, the transformation verse, he says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your minds from within. Do you see how he's, he's getting at how this happens in a life? He's getting at how God can move into a life, and the first step has to be that you and I present ourselves on the launching pad. We no longer sit back and just watch the world unravel. We ask ourselves, what am I up to as a, an agent of restoration? What is my role in this? How can I get on board? And then we show up, and God somehow makes us large enough for it. Somehow takes our brokenness and our inadequacy, and simply by our showing up, makes people out of us who change the world. But of course, that takes a habit change for you and me. Because as I read those stats about red and blue earlier, I bet you had the experience that I had when I first read them, which is, hey, that kind of describes me sometimes. Right? I bet there's nobody in the room or on, on their couch, I bet there's nobody in the room or on their couch that's fully redeemed in this area. We tend to stay biased and our culture kind of leads us by the nose. You and I have some change to make. So, how does that happen? Well, it's not a Harry Potter wand wave. It's not a thing where we show up on the launch pad and, and God just kind of shazams and we suddenly have no bigotry or bias or red-blue prejudices and we're off and running to restore the world. That's not exactly what Paul described, is it? Because in 12, 3 through 21, the rest of that chapter, Paul describes the painstaking process of us getting more humble. I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, not to think more highly of yourself than you ought, he starts off. And finding our place in community. You know, use your gift, let others use their gift. And then on with about 15 or 17 more commands. It turns out that we don't just still and let, sit still and let God wave a wand. You and I have practices that move us forward into this role of restoration. And that's where I want to go down the stretch here. Because I, I, want to, I want to notice something that you may not quite have run into. Did you know that political tribalism is addicting? Literally addicting? Some people were bright enough to say, well, let's watch people. Let's put the monitors on their brains and watch what happens in their brain as they watch Fox News if they're a red, MSNBC if they're a blue, right? And so they sat them down on their chairs and they, they w had them watch their, their kind of news, right? And they watched the brain monitor and you know what it looked like to them? 
To these brain scientists, it looked exactly like two other things. One is a very good friendship, and the other is what the brain does on opioids. How about that? We substitute for friendship either with drugs or with politics. <laughs> In a lonely world, we find our substitutes, but neither one works so well for us because, because when we sit there, we're lighting up our brain so that it wants to go further and further into that world and further and further away from the people who will hold the other one. So, so you and I have some practices to leave behind. We have some practices to gain. Right? If right now... We're arrogant about our own politics, about what we believe in the world, about ideology. If right now we're starting arrogant, we probably ought to get around to laying aside that arrogance. I think last time I spoke with you, I said something that I, I repeat today. For the next three weeks, just by way of getting a new habit, for the next three weeks, look in the mirror at least once a day and say, I could be wrong. Let's say it right now just to get you ready. One, two, three, I could be wrong. Doesn't mean convictions collapse. It doesn't mean my, my, uh, my convictions about politics, about theology, about all those things have to go into this relativistic mode where everything is okay, dude. No, it just means that I know that I haven't got all the answers, and if we practice that sort of repetition, eventually we're going to get it, not to think more highly than our, of ourselves than we ought as Paul puts it. If we haven't been listening, if we've just been talking, it wouldn't be a bad idea to develop the habit of listening. And it turns out, the brain scientists tell us, if we do that, we ought to do it in small bits. So give yourself a half hour chore. Tell yourself you're gonna sit down and listen to somebody. It doesn't even have to be somebody you disagree with. Listen to somebody for a half hour. Just listen and ask questions about it. Don't counter, don't do anything, just listen. See how tired you are afterward. And then work your way up to 35 minutes. Get better at listening is not a bad restoration habit. Right? The Jesus who calls us to love not only our neighbor but our enemy needs us to get some practices that help us do that. Right? And so, friends, the way God does this is by us showing up on the launching pad, knowing that we need help, and God supplying help as we practice and practice and practice and make habits that have been damaging become habits that are engaging and restorative. And what you may be experiencing right now is one of two things. Either you're saying, man, this is a drop in the ocean. I can go home and say whatever I say to the mirror and I can go home and listen to somebody for a half hour and the world will stay just the way it is. And that's probably what Esau thought. It's probably what Joseph thought. It's probably what Esther thought. It's probably what Peter thought. But it turns out that God actually uses small-time forgiveness, small-time openness, small-time listening to grow something entirely new without us knowing it. Significance can't be a barrier because God can figure out how to use what you do. And the second, so if, if significance is one argument, the second thing that you may be thinking is, am I up to this? I mean, I'm not a superhero. I'm not, I'm not a saint. I'm not, I'm not one of those people who just kind of has everything in order. But it turns out that when the, when the Houthis undertook their genocide of the Tutsis in Rwanda, Afterward, American missionaries went, some friends of mine went, and helped them pray together. And the people who forgave heroically were just like you and me. They weren't superstars. They weren't, they weren't superheroes. They were people who practiced. And when you see those women or men on the news who are, who are visiting in prison the person who shot to death their son or daughter, it looks superheroish, but they're people like you and me who practiced and practiced and felt the surge of God's help and came through in the clutch. And when a, a young Amish girl a few years ago ran into a madman who thought that young Amish kids were the big problem in the world 
and stepped forward and said, shoot me first. She wasn't any bigger or stronger than any of us. She had just practiced. Friends, what do you say we start to practice? What do you say we move toward one another? Because there's this passage in 2 Chronicles that is a great promise for us to end with. We've talked about restoration. We've talked about reconciliation. We've talked about transformation, and they all land in the same place, which is healing. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and forsake their sinful ways, then I will come to them, and I will forgive them, and... I will heal their land. I want in on that. How about you? Amen.